Pee Wee Herman will always be Pee Wee Herman, right? Even if he went and ventured on to some other shit, like people are gonna know him as Pee Wee. So I'm feeling nostalgic. I need to upload more. I guess I'll talk about Joji. Either of those things seem to come back to that guy anyway. Also got this beanie that I used to wear a lot around the time my obsession with Joji was at its peak. When it comes to YouTubing, I like to go method. <laughs> More like meth head. Lords of Lo-Fi. Bonus tracks. Dig? Now for those of you who found me but don't know who Joji is, which it's probably a higher number of people now that I've made like 3 million Who videos in a row. Oops. George Miller is one of the most adored figures in his sphere of alternative pop music, who initially made a splash with his unhinged yet weirdly artful Filthy Frank series, where him and his friends would make absolutely deplorable sketches and music while occasionally sprinkling in some social commentary. Now, I'm not going to focus too much on that this time around, because it frankly... <laughs> Um, gets enough lip service from people who still think it's 2016. That he who cast the first stone, etc. Getting this shit off my head. And if I am going to talk about Filthy Frank, I at least want to do it right. So for the time being, just know it was huge, it was grating, it was problematic, and it was totally fucking awesome. So in tandem with this YouTube channel was a side project called Joji, more in line with George's deeper, unironic taste in music from indie folk of the time to classic hip hop from the 80s and 90s. The Joji stuff is definitely the sounds that I, I wanna hear that take a lot of effort. I wouldn't put that kind of effort into the other mediums. Though at first a close kept secret, word got out about his beats and mixtapes and a stronger demand for his real music started to grow. Please come out with serious music. Now this music slowly outgrew his YouTuber roots, each major release evolving a bit more into his neo-soul sound that he's kind of known for now, while still leaving some of those lo-fi touches intact. And this trajectory ultimately landed him at the top of the Billboard charts for R&B, a first for an Asian artist. Those biracials are just built different. To sidetrack just a little bit, the reason I'm even making this video in the first place is because a TikTok that I made over a year ago now, just arbitrarily started to pop off. It was a... Hey, James from Idaho. It was a portion of a longer video in my Lords of Lo-Fi series, where he explained to pigeons and airplanes how he went about making one of his earliest SoundCloud hits, You Suck Charlie. My logic behind that was, so I sampled a Charlie Brown Christmas special song. I thought that song was special because for a lot of people, when they hear Christmas or, or think about like the holidays, you know, they get lonely and horny. Besides it not featuring my stupid face and voice or opinions, I think it's taking off for a couple of reasons right now. It combined a couple of sources, the raw interviews, the music itself, and even some material only true OGs will recognize. A Joe G OG, as it were. Seriously though, I'm still getting over these instructions to drawing Charlie Brown. That jump from three to four is insane. Not even Bob Ross could do that. Most of all though, seeing as some of this music is nearly a decade old, the nostalgia cycles simply revving up as it does. A lot can certainly happen in 10 years after all, and there's a desire to return to stabler, more comfortable times. This in mind, I thought I'd highlight some lesser known songs that have been shuffled around by the resulting Joji mania. Any kind of beat that I don't use, I can just like, shit it out onto the show because like then nothing, literally, literally nothing goes to waste. So while I think it goes without saying that George has only gotten better as an artist since he's been in the mainstream pop scene, I've covered his more recent stuff before and intend to do so again, I still have a major soft spot for these earlier tracks, that choppier, cut-up era where the low fidelity was as much a result of circumstance as it was a stylistic choice. Were you always uh, producing like on a laptop, on rock band, or whatever? Or? Yeah. So were there any like MIDI keyboards involved, or were you guys just like sometimes we use like keyboards midis and stuff depends on who i'm working with but really really we just we're drag and drop hell as recently as 2020 he's admitted to still using garage band to build a lot of his beats are you still straight garage band yeah yeah still straight garage band. i don't know how you do it. you have the hottest garage band beats of anyone i know Thank you, sir. i swear to god bro close the show i hate whenever kids start talking about like 
oh, you need this equipment, oh, you need this drum kit, da, da, da. I'm like, Joji's making heat in GarageBand. You really don't need shit, honestly. The aforementioned Chloe Burbank project is so legendary among fans that unofficial full versions are all over YouTube, combining the songs from that period with unrelated releases that nonetheless have an oral kinship. And that does include some of the prettier pink guy releases that had like ukulele or textures built into them right before he went back to singing about. Ass is bleeding, ass is bleeding, ass is bleeding. Some of these tracks were themselves released under 88 Rising as YouTube exclusives, and in some cases popped up as bonus tracks for re-releases like I Don't Wanna Waste My Time or Plastic Taste. Now one of the most obvious traits of these early Joji tracks and said pink guy tracks that teeter on being a Joji track is the fact that George raps in them. They call me the Grain Man, ancient ritual prank can help cook rice on a spiritual level for those willing and able to be the king of the table. <laughs> but I'm always doing better than your peers and your bitch. So what you trying to say about my wrist? This is a story about a young boy, unemployed, bastardized boy, looking fuck with the loudest noise. And he's explained the sociological reasons why he eventually stopped doing this, even though he still operates and produces in spaces where people do rap. Did you ever incorporate any more rap in your Joji music? Getting rappers on songs, 100%, as well as making beats for rappers. That's that's fine, but I don't think I'll be uh, incorporating rap into Joji music. First of all, I don't think I'm that good. Like, I don't think I have a right to just step in, like a white guy stepping in and being like, hey. Who would have thought that a white boy would bring hip hop back? Y'all don't know what's about to happen, baby. Team 10, Los Angeles, Cali boy. At least back then when I was doing it, I was doing it as like a as a gimmick, you know, so I knew my place as a party rapper, but I don't want to get mixed up in that kind of stuff. Car thought, not to be confused with car thought, and especially not with car thought. Gimmick or not, I don't think the rapping era of Joji is completely without artistic merit. Being that and admitting to be that is a pretty good way to kind of distance yourself from the more troubling aspects of cross-cultural rap. <coughs> Gentrification. <coughs> American cycles. It's what allows people like Bo Burnham to make stuff that's rappy or hip-hoppy without stepping on any toes. So when George was doing this, I found that the more compelling tracks were the ones that were named after food. I think most people would agree that the food tracks on Pink Season in particular are the best tracks on that album. And in many regards, the only ones really worth listening to if you value your brain cells. I do not. A forgotten track, what I believe to be the first or at least earliest Joji music video, Waffle House in Guam. Uh -huh. I know a place and a plan you can follow. A tropical place where you can flip waffles. Damn. Pretty upbeat, tongue-in-cheek track that shares, in my opinion, a bit of commentary kinship with weird McDonald rap, aka tribute to Ronald. While these tracks aren't to be taken seriously, like real rap, they do have some pretty compelling and thought-provoking ideas in them. A bit of a critique slash nihilistic embrace of globalization, or if you took a social class, McDonaldization. Western branding and product being peddled worldwide, thanks to stuff. See, back in 48 was when I heard of this magic place when the atom bomb crushed a small country in its natural state. Rebuilt itself into a fine little real estate and reeled in any American chains with exceptional taste. Again, he's not super doom and gloom about it. He's just making a statement of that which is in a catchy, memorable way. Yeah, he was able to do that even if he was a gimmick rapper which I think is worth commending. I'm pretty sure the shot has gradually been going upward. We can use this as a transition back to the main footage. I didn't know what to expect. I don't know if you're gonna rap. Definitely do a little, little, little singing, you know what I mean? But like, you know, low pressure singing. Low uh, pressure? Low pressure R&B. All right, R&B, low pressure R&B. At the stage, he was still an up-and-comer on all fronts of his creative career and comparatively closer to his genesis as a producer, which, as is almost always the case, was just fucking around with his friends. Speaking of which, one of my favorites remains Once in a While, a collaboration with fellow musician and childhood friend Ray Brown, who up till this recording I had never actually sampled his solo work, and I gotta say, it's really good, super well produced. It's similar to Joji music, but it's a bit more soulful, a bit more optimistic lyrically. Go listen to his song Street Fighter, it's on Spotify. Silky, silky track. 
But yeah, Once in a While was around the time that Joji music really started to take off as its own entity. Far more R&B flavor than the trap beats and mumble rap. George infamously performed this at a place called The Boiler Room in Los Angeles. Maybe it wasn't Los Angeles. Um, all of California is Los Angeles to people who don't live in California. But yeah, that was like his debut uh, live performance. And to this day, it remains quite the source of meme fodder. Please forgive me. Can someone turn it up? Can we turn this up? Turn it up. Blow pump. I'm sick. <clears throat> Can we turn it up a bit? This bitch better unblock me. No, I'm just kidding. You all fuck with Wonderwall. A more recent and pretty interestingly put together compilation of odds and ends came in the form of a VHS tape called The Lost Ballads. The standout track on this actually was the opening walk on track of the concert that I went to and made a video for like a year and a half ago, or maybe it was two years. What is time? What is space? I know not what either are. But that song is called Don't You Know I Love You, which is all vibes. Beach Boy harmonies, clickety-clack textures, hissing, just like all, all the noises that people of our ilk happen to like stirred into one little snippet of music to get you amped for the concert. But when you combine that with the means of the original release, all of those traits are enhanced a bit because it's on an analog medium. So all the elements of those noises that I already like, it just feels older, more nostalgic and longing. That's been dude's MO since the jump, I guess. The only true bummer of this corner of the Joji verse is how much harder it is to find these gems. While a few of them find their way onto later releases, as I've said, there's nonetheless some glaring omissions from his earlier catalog on places like Spotify. Not only does this apply to the Green Echo collab and the Burbank songs, but also his fan favorite remix of Daughter's emotional folk tune, Medicine. And even one of my own favorite tracks, Rain On Me. Don't rain on me. What I'm saying is, how dare you make me continue to resort to SoundCloud or YouTube to listen to these tracks instead of a more easy to access monopoly that notoriously exploits and underpays the artists that it features on its service. How dare you? Lame sauce, dog water, as the kids say. I look like a kid, but I'm 30. And it's up to you to find that either endearing or creepy. I wanted to pull it off. It didn't happen. Ew. Why do I do this? I do this every couple of years where I do some mouth shit with the microphone, which if I were to truly embrace, I'd probably be more popular and richer than I currently am. So don't tempt me, brain. Don't tempt me. But yeah, I, ho I hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane and assorted rambles. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please go check out the rest of my Lords of Lo-Fi series proper, not the bonus tracks. This is bonus tracks. This is an offshoot. The first episode to which is about Joji and how he got me into hip hop on God. But yeah, this was a cool opportunity to focus on underappreciated tunes from those early years. For me, and I'm sure for a lot of people watching this right now, the dude's just been a continued source of inspiration. Something of a true north when it comes to being a YouTuber or an artist of any kind and finding a niche of people who get what you're putting out. Like, as I said, it's been nearly a decade since a lot of this music came out, which is crazy to think about. Really puts into perspective how much faster time seems to be moving, at least from my POV. Ta-ta for now. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe if this did anything for you. Yeah, this is a reversible meme. Yeah, I mean, I'm the server. Uh,